The name of Dodge City, Kansas is known far and wide, and her reputation was not enviable. To say the one has never heard of Dodge City is to say that he or she does not read. No reader of books, newspapers, or magazines can make such a claim. No city of its size in this country has occupied so much literary space. This is the story of Dodge City, of its early days of vice and corruption, and one man's ability to take back what was once his. Buffalo City, a frontier settlement that later became known as Dodge City, was founded in 1872. The geographical location on the plains was at the nearest point of the Santa Fe Railroad, five miles west of Fort Dodge. The settlement stood at the edge of the flat Arkansas River bottom, just under the bare hills to the north, 100 yards to water, and 100 miles to wood. Her commanding position enabled the city to maintain the commercial and industrial supremacy. You know, a lot has been said about the reputation of Dodge City over the years. A reputation that's well deserved, mind you, but what a lot of folks don't realize is that story started from day one. You see, Dodge City is not so much a geographical spot on the map as it is a, a living thing. Dodge is, is an entity. Dodge had to exist. Because if it didn't, something else would have had to come along and take its place. It's as if the lines of Western fate just converged on this little spot just north of the Arkansas River. And the rest is history. In its early days, its purpose was to provide whiskey and other vices to the soldiers stationed at Fort Dodge and the buffalo hunters who fed them. In the beginning, Dodge City was at the very heart of the buffalo country. The city's population of 500 that first year was almost entirely due to the buffalo trade. The buffalo hunters and the soldiers from Fort Dodge came to the makeshift settlement to buy supplies, drink, and get away from their boredom. The town grew almost in a night into a tented little city, and every man was a law unto himself. In a few days, Boot Hill Graveyard was started. At the approach of night, the dance halls, saloons, gambling halls were a blaze of light and activity. The sharp report of the six-shooter became a nightly occurrence, and in the morning, the usual question was, how many were killed last night? A documented 18 men died from gunshot wounds, and newspapers identified nearly half again that number as wounded. Right about this time that something happened in the United States that a lot of folks have forgotten about. Railroad only got a few miles west of Dodge City and the, uh, the stock market panic of 1871-1872 hit the nation. Railroad ran out of money and overnight a lot of folks were out of work. They went into buffalo hunting didn't have anything else to do. A good hunter could easily make a hundred dollars a day. And it wasn't very long after that, just a, a couple of years, that the buffalo trade that had been sailing along pretty smoothly for a number of years already. And just like that, the buffalo were gone. Hardly had the railroad reached there, long before a depot could be built, when operations were conducted from inside a humble boxcar, business began. Hence, such a business. Dozens of cars a day were loaded with hides, meat, and dozens of carloads of grain. Flour and provisions arrived each day. See when that 24-year-old Canadian by the name of George Hoover 
rolled up in 1872 with his wagon load of whiskey, dropped the end of his wagon, started selling booze at 25 cents a ladle. That started a, a stack of cards falling like you wouldn't believe. Overnight, we had a boom town. Competing saloons, businessmen vying for each, with each other over economics. What they knew was coming. What was coming was the railroad. Several months earlier, the Atchison Peak and Santa Fe had started in eastern Kansas, making tracks on their way west. These folks in growing Dodge City, they knew what that was going to bring, and it was going to bring money. When quarantine laws closed Wichita to the cattle trade, Dodge City emerged as the queen of the cow towns. As the cattle shipping season of 1876 approached, Dodge townsmen braced for a new and greater invasion, the Texas cattle trade. And on Christmas Eve of 1875, during a committee meeting to appoint temporary officials, the town of Dodge City became officially divided. 75,000 head of cattle moved out of Dodge City every year between 1875 and 1883. That buffalo money turned into cattle money. Going back to human nature. All these businessmen, they saw that money. They saw these Texans coming up, loaded, money in their pockets, burning a hole in their pockets. Well, they gave them something to spend it on. Whiskey. Dodge City's very first trade. Gambling. Women. Prostitution. But it was not until June 1st, 1876, when Michael W. Sutton established residence, when the wide open town faction was powerfully augmented, and the Dodge City gang was formed. During the first years of the cattle trade, the city's businessmen divided into three factions. The gang, which fully supported the cattle trade, represented the liquor interests, and wanted Dodge City to be a wide open town. Businessmen who wanted to keep the cattle trade out, but wanted some restrictions on the saloon and brothels, and German businessmen and farmers who wanted to promote farming in Ford County. Sutton, a canny lawyer, became the brains behind the right faction's political maneuvering. Bob Wright, a former Fort Dodge settler whose general store operated in partnership with Charlie Rath, was one of the first businesses established in Dodge City. Allied with Wright were James H. Dog Kelly and his partner Peter L. Beatty, proprietors of the Alhambra Saloon, Gambling Hall, and Restaurant. The gang advocated for unregulated saloons, brothels, gambling dens, and dance halls to draw cowboys to town. Things were moving along at a pretty good clip. The saloons were full with Texas gambling money and cattle money. The gang was in charge. Charlie Bassett and Wyatt Earp policed the city. Bat Masterson was county sheriff. And Mike Sutton, the uh, county attorney, was the legal end of all of it. Anything that the Earps and the Mastersons couldn't handle on their own Went straight to Mike Sutton, he'd back him up. The gang consistently dominated municipal affairs, with Kelly serving as mayor, and gang members routinely elected to the city council and to other municipal offices. From 1875 to 1883, more than 75,000 head of cattle were shipped annually from Dodge City. Many thousands more were driven through Dodge to stock northern ranges, or to be shipped from other railheads. Firearms were prohibited in Dodge City. Firearms is strictly prohibited. However, in 1876, it is estimated that as many as 25 people died of gunshot wounds. It only took 10 years for Dodge City to build the wild and wicked reputation it had held since the town's beginning. The town site was given many names over the years, from the wickedest city in the West to the beautiful bibulous Babylon of the frontier. But in 1879, things started to change. See, Mr. Sutton fell in love. He married the niece of one of the major reformers of Dodge City, Mr. Alonzo B. Webster. 
Now Webster had come from Hayes City, another frontier town, just as violent as Dodge City was in the early years. Webster knew something about fighting. Saloon owner, clerk, former Civil War soldier, Webster was the type of man who could handle Dodge City. What he couldn't handle was going up against the Mastersons, the Earps, and the gang. He needed help. So he enlisted his newfound family member, Mike Sutton. And overnight, the county attorney, the legal muscle of the Dodge City gang, became a reformer. Not long after that, Sutton became the official attorney for the Atchison Peak and the Santa Fe Railroad. As you know, the railroad from day one was opposed to the vice in Dodge City. They wanted to build a depot and a roundhouse in Dodge, but they knew full well that the reputation that Dodge City had would never suit them economically. They threatened to build outside of town, 30 miles east of here in Kinsley. Well, the gang knew that they needed that railroad presence in Dodge if they wanted to maintain the cattle trade. They fought the railroad tooth and nail, but they lost their legal muscle. The gang was in dire straits. They saw the end was coming and they needed to put up a fight. While Dodge City and the gang prospered during these years, not all of its citizens agreed with how the gang operated. The Texas drovers that the town depended on for its prosperity scared and intimidated the respectable citizens of Dodge City. A reform movement began to grow that questioned the gang's control of the town. Gang members in important positions in county and city government were replaced in a series of elections. Opposing the Dodge City gang was a group of men who claimed to stand for law and order. Dodge was growing. Dodge was changing. It was becoming more metropolitan. Former gang members like Long Branch Saloon owner Chuck Beeson was starting to move on to bigger and better things. Bill Harris and his partner Chuck Beeson owned the Long Branch Saloon, and Luke Short managed the gambling concession in this establishment. In February 1883, Beeson sold his interest to Luke Short. The ownership change was made at a time when Dodge was undergoing one of its periodic political struggles and set off a chain of events that culminated in the celebrated Dodge City War. Now Luke Short was a Texan. Luke was friends with everybody. He knew he could bring in that Texas money and make a killing in Dodge City, especially in the void left by some of the former gang members. Short and former Beeson partner William Harris were the official owners of the Long Branch Saloon. Bill Harris ran the business and the liquor trade. Short ran everything else. The Long Branch was one of a string of saloons and gambling houses on Front Street. Its neighbor to one side was George M. Hoover's retail and wholesale liquor store. On the other was the Alamo Saloon, owned and operated by A.B. Webster, the mayor. Luke Short, himself a Texan, was very popular with the trail hands from the Lone Star State, and after he took over at the Long Branch, Webster, Hoover, and other competitors for the cowboy trade noticed a definite loss of business. Webster was a stubborn and strong-willed man, and was not above using his political office to further his personal investments. He set out to break Luke Short. Now, Mr. Webster, the, uh, family member of legal muscle Mike Sutton. Webster ran a saloon right next door to the Long Branch, the Alamo Saloon, trying to cater to that Texan sounding name, bringing in all that Texas cap. Problem is they were going next door to the Long Branch. Webster was losing money hand over fist. He couldn't compete. He didn't have the name brand. Everybody knew the Long Branch Saloon. More importantly, everybody knew Luke Short. Webster had to do something. He couldn't do it over the business table. He had to do it legally. In 
March, a slate of candidates for city offices was selected at a mass meeting of voters. Luke's partner, Bill Harris, was the choice for mayor on a ticket backed by the remnants of the old Dodge City gang, led by former mayor Jim Kelly. A few days later, an opposition slate was chosen by the anti-gang group headed by Mike Sutton, Nick Klain, and Webster. Its candidate for mayor was Larry Digger. This faction was ostensibly reformist, which apparently explained Webster's decision not to run again. Now without the weight of the muscle left behind after the Earps and the Mastersons moved out, the gang just didn't have a leg to stand on. The reformers swept the mayoral election of 1883, and Larry Dagger was the new mayor of Dodge City. It could probably be shown by facts and figures that there is no distinctly native criminal class except government. Mark Twain. Immediately after taking office, Dagger and Webster set about destroying the gang. The city council passed two ordinances, 70 and 71. Ordinance 70 concerned the suppression of vice and immorality in the city of Dodge City and was intended to shut down the brothels and body houses that were common in Dodge. Ordinance 71 targeted gambling and drinking. Anyone without a legal profession could be found in violation of the ordinance to define and publish vagrancy. In both cases, the offender could be fined or jailed. But they singled out the Long Branch, the center of gang power. They centered out Luke Short. Luke, who knew that he was the last bastion for gang power. It was a statement. They knew it, he knew it, and all of Dodge City knew it. On April 28, 1883, officers arrested three women in the Long Branch Saloon who were supposedly employed as singers. Women entertainers at other saloons and dance halls, including those at the Old House Saloon, owned by Alonzo Webster, weren't arrested. It appeared the citizens of Dodge City didn't elect reformers. They elected men whose goal was to take control of the lucrative saloon business for their own gain. The Long Branch was owned by gang member W.H. Harris and his partner Luke Short. Now the police officer on duty that evening was Lewis B. Hartman, one of these brand new police officers that they'd hired. Lewis didn't know what he was doing, never wore a badge before in his life. When Luke was told several hours after his singers were caged that no women had been arrested in any other saloons or gambling places, he stormed over to the jail to demand their release. Lewis Hartman, one of the new police officers, saw Luke approaching in the darkness. Seeing the diminutive Texan walking toward him with a brace of six guns displayed prominently, Hartman suddenly remembered Short's reputation as a deadly killer when aroused. Hartman jerked his gun and threw lead at the oncoming Short. He fired hastily and his shot merely kicked up dust behind Luke. The little gambler, surprised but cool and calm as always, drew and returned the officer's fire. But even as Luke pulled trigger, Hartman was running. In his anxiety to depart the vicinity, he tripped over his own feet and pitched headlong off the high sidewalk onto Front Street as Luke's shot whistled past his ear. Short thought he had killed Hartman and raced back to the Long Branch and barricaded the door waiting for the inevitable retaliation. Loading a shotgun, he barricaded the door of the saloon and refused to submit to arrest. The next morning, Luke Short heard the voice of Dodge City Marshal Jack Bridges calling to him from outside the saloon door. Marshal Bridges informed Luke that Officer Hartman was alive and uninjured. Marshal, I told you already. I ain't coming out. Mighty comfortable in here. I think I plan on staying. Further, Marshal Bridges promised that if Short came out of the saloon, unarmed and surrendered, he would be charged only a small fine and released. I told you, it's all just been a mistake. I've got to charge you for disturbing the peace. 
you've got to pay a small fine. You're wasting your time. But you're more than welcome to try and come on in here. Come on out. We'll talk about this. It'll all be easy. That's just not the way I see it, Marshal. I ain't gonna budge. Luke, I've had about enough of this. All right? What can I do to convince you? Open that window. Look out here. Hey, Hartman's here. He's fine. Lay down your guns. Come on out. Hey, you're fine. It'll all be over. Say something. Come on out, Mr. Short. I'm not mad. I shot first. We don't want to arrest you. You're sure? You lay down them guns. Come on out. We'll talk about this. Just come on out and let's talk. Okay. I'll come out. We'll talk. Convinced by the marshal's words, Luke Short exited the Long Branch Saloon. Short didn't realize how serious Webster and Dagger were in the plot against the gang. See, that's it. I told you everything was going to be fine. Don't move, Luke. Glad you came out of there. I didn't want to come in after you. Good lion. I'm taking you in for the assault on Officer Hartman here. Cuffs on. Bridges arrested Luke Short for the assault of Officer Hartman and threw him in jail. Though he was released later in the day under a $2,000 bond, Luke Short knew that war had just been declared in Dodge City. The next morning, once they had tricked Luke out of the Long Branch, they arrested him hauled him over to the jail, held him on a $2,000 bond, rounded up a bunch of his gambling compatriots. Now here's the kicker. Luke was asking for a lawyer. He knew he wasn't guilty of murder. They'd informed him of that. Officer Hartman was alive and well. But denying Luke counsel, that was the illegal part. He knew his rights but the city officials wouldn't give them to him. This was a few years before the Miranda deal came around. Well, they gave Luke a choice. Accused of being undesirable vagrants, Luke Short and the five gamblers were taken from the city of jail by a large group of heavily armed men, led by Mayor Dagger and Thomas Nixon, who escorted them to the train station. There, the men were given a choice, east or west. With no other immediate options, Luke Short headed east. Luke was over a barrel in Dodge City. He knew it. Something sort of stuck in his crawl. Luke had never lost a fight in his life, and he wasn't about to lose this one. If he couldn't handle it with his own gun, he'd handle it with everybody else's. In Kansas City, Short learned more details of what he was up against. The mayor and his men intended to use whatever force was necessary to keep him out of town. Tom Nixon led a shotgun brigade inspecting all incoming trains for undesirable persons. Luke Short's friends, including George Hoover, advised him that Dodge City was too dangerous for his return. Luke's friend suggested he sell his interest in the Long Branch and cut his losses. Anger is an acid that can do more harm to the vessel in which it is stored than to anything on which it is poured. Mark Twain A thing about Luke is that Luke knew everybody, and they all liked him better than anybody else. All he had to do was get word to Bat Masterson, Wyatt Earp, fellas like Rowdy Joe Lowe, Shotgun Collins, gunmen that he'd known from Dodge, 
Texas, Tombstone, Arizona. He started sending telegrams. He found Bat in Colorado. Bat got a hold of Wyatt Earp. Wyatt got a hold of everybody in Arizona. And they all started gathering to come see what was up in Dodge. Meanwhile, in Kansas City, Luke Short decided to take matters into his own hands. Good morning, Mr. Short. What can I do for you? Good morning, son. There's some telegrams you have sent out. Oh, yes, sir. Well, let me see. Texas, Kansas, Arizona? You've got friends all over, Mr. Short. He wired old friends and requested they return to Kansas. Well, I can take care of that. Well, Mr. Short! Bat Masterson? THE Bat Masterson? Yes, son. He's a friend of mine. Think you can get a telegram to him? I can do that. On May 14th, 1883, Bat Masterson arrived in Kansas City to discuss the Dodge City problem with his old friend. Now, Sheriff Hank Ole and Mayor Dagger and A.B. Webster, they're, they're getting so nervous, they wound up hiring a spy funded by a state newspaper to come in and feed false information, to try to infiltrate the gang, find out what was going on, report back. Well, Luke found out about it. They started feeding him false information. Eastern Kansas newspapers covering the events unfolding in Dodge City began a lively coverage of the force assembling to help short. Masterson's presence in Kansas City means just one thing, and that he is going to Dodge City. Masterson today is joined by a few other pleasant gentlemen who are on their way to the tea party at Dodge. One of them is Wyatt Earp, the famous marshal. Another is Joe Lowe, otherwise known as Rowdy Joe. And still another is Shotgun Collins. There are others who will make up the party, but as yet they have not arrived. Altogether, it is a very pleasant party. Their entrance into Dodge City will mean that a desperate fight will take place. And once Bat Masterson and a few others met with Luke Short in Kansas City, word started getting out. Newspapers, not just in Kansas, but across the country, were getting word of the gathering of the guns. Everybody knew there was going to be a war in Dodge City if something didn't happen. There was a panic. Dodge was getting nervous. Kansas was getting nervous. The whole country was starting to wait on bated breath to find out what was going on. After the meeting in Kansas City, Bat started heading back west. He took a private train, headed back to Colorado. His train stopped in Dodge City. Bat didn't get off the train and refused admittance to anybody else to get on. He wasn't ready to start the fight yet. The reformers had muscled out Luke Short. They were taking over the saloon business in Dodge City. What they weren't doing was delivering on their campaign promises. The people of Dodge City voted for men they thought would reform the wickedest city in the West. What they got instead was one group of saloon owners forcibly telling another group of saloon owners where Dodge Cityans could or could not conduct their business. Revenge is wicked and unchristian and in every way unbecoming and I am not the man to countenance it or show it any favor. But it is powerful sweet anyway. Mark Twain. Nerves were starting to run pretty red all over town. At this point, County Sheriff George Hinkle, the man who had defeated Bat Masterson in the last county election, he'd been a former bartender and was in the pocket of Webster like everybody else. You know, Sheriff Hankel was starting to get a little nervous. He was out of his element, and he knew it. He started writing for help. Sending daily telegrams off to the Kansas governor, George Glick. I need help, he says. These folks are coming in. I don't have the manpower to fight them off. He didn't know what to do. All he knows is that every gun in the West is going to descend on Dodge City. 
And there he sits by himself trying to fight him off. He needs help and he needs it fast. He's getting scared. Folks around Dodge City are communicating with Luke Short. He knows it. He can't stop it. They're saying, don't come back yet, Luke. There's a shotgun brigade watching every train that comes in. They're keeping undesirables out of town. That's the best he can do. It's illegal, but it's all he's got. Of course, word of Short's reinforcement reached Dodge City. It had the desired effect. Sheriff George Hinkle wired the governor in a panic. Governor Glick dispatched the Adjutant General of the Kansas National Guard to evaluate the situation. Mayor Digger hired more deputies to watch the trains. It seemed a showdown was inevitable. By May of 1883, tensions in Dodge City between rival factions of saloon owners threatened to boil over and affect the entire state of Kansas. Ford County Sheriff George Hinkle wired Governor George Washington Glick for help. Dodge Cityans Robert Wright and Richard Hardesty visited the governor and asked him to stay out of Dodge City business. Confused by conflicting reports, Governor Glick alerted two companies of the Kansas National Guard at Sterling and Newton to be ready for immediate service. This was a legitimate fear. Mob rule was going to dictate the legal state of Kansas from this point on if something didn't happen. And Glick knew he had to do something. He just didn't know what. Now at this point, the last major player in his story enters the scene. Adjutant General Thomas Moonlight. Governor Glick had sent him out as a personal representative to smooth things over if he could. Bring all hands to the table, sit them down, said, we need to figure this out. He's waiting in Dodge City on bated breath like everyone else. Luke and his friends didn't head directly to Dodge City. Bat Masterson traveled to Colorado. Luke himself went to Caldwell, Kansas, located southeast of Dodge City. It was only a temporary stop. Everyone knew it was only a matter of time until they converged on Dodge City. Wyatt Earp arrived first. His arrival prompted Sheriff Hinkle to wire the governor again, requesting assistance. Despite rumors that they would gather in Cimarron, Wyatt Earp, Luke Short, and WF Battalion gathered at a restaurant in Kinsley to discuss their final plans for re-entering Dodge City. Bat Masterson, Texas Jack Vermillion, and Shotgun Collins were also lurking in the area. Earp is in town with his faction. Luke rides in from the other direction with his guns. They all arrive in Dodge City one morning. Sheriff Hankel, A.B. Webster, Mayor Dagger, General Thomas Moonlight, they, they throw up their hands. They, this has just gotten out of hand. Folks, we need to sit down. Broker a peace deal. That's what they did. Like any good gambler, Short waited to move until he held all the cards. On June 5th, 1883, Luke Short and his gunman friends arrived in Dodge City. Mayor Dagger and Sheriff Hingle panicked. They ordered all gambling establishments closed to reduce the chance of bloodshed. Hinkle tried one last time to obtain assistance from Governor Glick. In the end, Mayor Dagger and his men had no choice but to negotiate with Luke Short. By June 8, 1883, the saloon war, as it would be called, was over. With the help of General Moonlight of the Kansas National Guard, the hostile parties reached an agreement. The agreement allowed Short to stay in Dodge City and continue the operation of the Long Branch Saloon. It also restricted all gambling in Dodge City to the back rooms of those establishments. Dagger, Webster, and their supporters agreed to this deal on one condition. Luke Short's friends had to leave town. Once the peace deal was finally brokered, 
why everybody went back to business. Status quo was maintained in Dodge City. Short and Harris reopened the Long Branch Saloon. Gambling was reopened, confined to the back rooms of the saloons. But it had one shred of violence broken out in the Dodge City War. The state of Kansas would never have been the same. Federal law might never have been the same. See, Governor George Glick maintained his legacy that moment in Dodge City. By sending out General Thomas Moonlight, brokering this peace deal between every gun that ever strapped leather in the West and all the gamblers in Dodge City and the, the Dodge City saloon war that threatened to burn down the state of Kansas, he proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that rule of law was more powerful than mob violence, even in Dodge City. To celebrate their victory, Luke Short and his friends sat for a formal portrait. They titled their photograph, the Dodge City Peace Commission. Okay, gentlemen. One man's ability to take back 